All right. Welcome back, everybody. And jingle, jingle, jingle to all of our listeners. Uh, you are now in the Den of Sin, long time no see with Devin and James. I am your co-host, Devin Lucas. And with me always is my buddy, James Dufresne. How you doing, James? Feeling good, feeling better. Uh, it was a rough few weeks, but I'm, I'm, uh, I wouldn't say fully recovered, but I'm on the road to full recovery. So I'm, I'm doing good. Okay, good, good. Um, I, I don't know if you wanted to mention it to anybody or, or not, but uh, for what, what you're feeling better from, but uh, it, it's at least part of why we've been away so long. Uh, I don't know if you yeah. want to share that. <laughs> so yeah, I got the, I got the, uh, I got the COVIDs. I got all, all 19 of the COVIDs. Um, yeah, I was fully vaccinated and it still hit me super hard, um, much harder than, in fact, I kept thinking like, God damn, if I wasn't vaccinated, like how rough would this have gotten? Cause about five days in, like I couldn't stand up. Um, I couldn't eat anything. Um, thankfully I was most alarmed by, I was most, uh, I was paying a lot of attention to my breathing because that's a lot of people like, how's your breathing? And then sort of made me extra anxious about it to begin with. But, you know, I never really got too uh, out of breath, but severe coughing and chest pains and just pretty much everything. And then, you know, my poor son, he got COVID. Uh, He got positive. In fact, I'm pretty sure I caught it from him. He probably caught it at school, but he also had strep throat. So he got both those diagnoses. Yeah. So, but he, uh, he, he told like dealt with it like a champ about five days into um quarantine he was just playing video games and just hanging out and you know being his normal jovial self so i hit didn't hit him as hard as it hit me but again my age and uh just it just it wrecked me for a few days but i'm feeling better so but it's no joke you know i i at this point nobody should I, i i think if you're a reasonable adult at this point you should take it seriously but it you know in case uh any of our listeners think that it's still a bunch of hogwash uh it kicked my ass pretty rough so i'm happy to be on the other side of it so everybody get vaccinated get your booster shots um it could literally save your life so i'll end i'll end that psa right there (laughs) well i'm glad you're back and and full confession that was not the only reason we've been away for so long there's been a lot of stuff going on uh in both of our lives uh, it is a busy time of year, and this is one of my uh, few years in my adult life that I haven't been working retail at Christmas, so I've been thankful for that to some extent, uh, <laughs> but uh, Christmas is still just a, a busy time, and uh, I'll confess, I, mean, with, I, I have my own sort of disability issues going on here, uh, again, nothing too concerning, but I have been... Uh, taking gabapentin which has a tendency i take it three times a day and it has a tendency to make me a bit of a zombie and yeah i i've been working on a new screenplay uh which is going to be my attempt at a spaghetti western obviously it can't be a spaghetti western as i am in no way italian or spanish (laughs) or uh you know any any of the other uh (laughs) german uh spaghetti westerns come from all of europe really uh but in in uh doing my research on that it has taken up so much of my movie watching time to be honest that i just haven't had the energy between the zombification and the uh inspiration let's say uh i I haven't had time to really follow up on a lot of stuff so i apologize to you and i apologize to our listeners that it's taken us so long we haven't been around since halloween uh, but we weren't going to let this holiday go by, and we certainly weren't going to go out without having one more episode in 2021. So uh, we are here to talk about, uh, I'd initially thought Christmas oddities, but I think it's just Christmas favorites. Uh, movies that are outside of what people might normally think of as perennials, you know, because there's there's obviously... Christmas Story, which I've owned on every single format, but I don't think I've ever watched it uh, in my adult life on any of the discs that I purchased because it's on 24-7 on Christmas. Mm-hmm. Exactly, <laughs> on TBS or TNT or one of them. But yeah, there's Christmas Story and It's a Wonderful Life and both Miracle on 34th Street, even the remake has its fans. Uh, not I am not one of them, but uh, I do love the original. Um, 
but uh, there, there's a lot of Christmas stuff that's kind of Christmas adjacent or not necessarily cheerful, uh, but are still Christmas movies. And uh, before we get into our picks, I think we both have some interesting picks. Um, I do want to talk to you about what are some things like what what makes a Christmas movie? Because there's so many movies that take place at Christmas that people want to claim as Christmas movies now. And they may or may not actually be Christmas movies outside of their setting. I mean, I'm normally I'm normally the type of person that gets really uptight about, you know, define genres or define terminology of, you know, a lot of uh, arbitrary rules of my own, you know, choosing. But I think with Christmas movies, I think if it's a movie that you, Christmas has become, it's, oh God, I'm trying so hard not to turn this into some sort of political statement, but, you know, <laughs> obviously, you know, the meaning of Christmas uh, really should be what the holiday is about and giving and being around your family and loved ones and friends and, you know, peace on earth and goodwill to man. But, um, you know, people who think Die Hard is a Christmas movie, if it, if you like it and watch it during Christmas time, cool. Like, I'm not going to get too upset <laughs> by it. It, you know, it's, it's one of the things, if it takes place on Christmas, is it a Christmas movie? I mean, that's up to you to decide. It wasn't, you know, I was, I was always well aware of certain movies that took place on Christmas, but didn't necessarily like claim to be a Christmas movie. I think growing up as a kid specifically, Christmas is so important as a kid that you notice anything Christmassy. Sure, um, but growing up, I never would have thought of, say, Gremlins as a Christmas movie. But now it is like, like Christmas is part of the plot of Gremlins. Yeah, I, I will say Gremlins is a Christmas movie. Yeah, I, I agree and, with you. I agree yeah, with you. Yeah, and that, that was a movie I think I watched a lot as a kid around Christmas. Where Die Hard, I'd watch, you know, whenever. Like, whenever I was in the mood to watch Die Hard. So, um, you know. I do have thoughts on Die Hard. Um, I, I have an argument for it and I know it's uh, guys it's a tired old is it or isn't it but you know we've never gone through it we've never talked about it on our show so we're we're going to take our turn um, yeah, I, there's I mean obviously like we said Gremlins Home Alone is as much as Gremlins you know they're not they're, they're full on Christmas movies um, and then there's stuff like Rocky Four. I don't think of as a Christmas movie. I don't know why people think Iron Man Three is outside of that it takes place at Christmas. Um, there's apparently a new trend of people watching The Shining, and I'm like, no, that is not <laughs> like like now we're just saying movies with snow for no, God's sakes, yeah. and that's no, The Shining is not a Christmas movie. But I think the um, the best way to define Die Hard as a Christmas movie is to compare it and contrast it to its uh, contemporary equal, which is Lethal Weapon. And I do not consider Lethal Weapon a Christmas movie. Uh, and, and that is because it comes down to the plot. I think it's a Christmas movie if Christmas is a part of the plot. You can remove Christmas entirely from Lethal Weapon. That bust scene at the beginning with uh, Riggs going crazy and, and catching the drug dealers, that could be a pumpkin patch. Uh, that could be a back alley. It could be anything. It was a creative choice to make it a Christmas tree farm. Uh, there's obviously Christmas music and things and like that. I also that. think that I also think there's a juxtaposition in Lethal Weapon. A lot of movies, one of my favorite movies of all time that I, I uh, bring up on the show too often, uh, Sylvester Stallone's Cobra. <laughs> it also takes place during Christmas time. Yes. You only know that from a few hints. But I think certain films of the time... Well, don't you with, every Christmas order a pizza and cut it up with scissors? Scissors, exactly. Is that and only at my house? my guns? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but I think a lot of films would make a point of saying, like, they would use the iconography of Christmas in California to say, like, uh, it's, you know, L.A. and California don't really go. It's hot and it's immoral and... It's all about, you know, whatever. It lights so I, up in the palm trees. And... Exactly. So I think there's that element that a lot of those movies just threw in as some extra, like, sort of, I don't know, a stylistic or aesthetic choice um, to sort of make a cheap or easy, you know, sort of point. But, um, but yeah, to me, like, you know, Die Hard, you know, ho, ho, ho. I mean, there's very distinct Christmassy representation in that film that is 
very much into the overall spirit of the movie. And so that's why I don't have a John McClane is not there. And in fact, nobody's even in the building if it's not Christmas. Yeah, so exactly. 100%. Yeah, so that's why I think when people say Die Hard's a Christmas movie, I've never had a problem. But there's a million movies that take, even if it's, you know, for one period in the movie, you know, a lot of movies they go through, you know, it's told over, you know, maybe a specific year or over the years. And yeah, Godfather movies have Christmas covers scene. Christmas. Yeah. Yes. So, but. But I will say, like, I don't, to me, like, I have my own, like, to me, I still think of, I personally think of, I will always relate the movie Cobra to Christmas, just because it has that specific scene, and, you know, like I said, there's, you know, there's scenes where there's Christmas decorations, but specifically, um, you know, that my, that the, when he's eating the pizza, the commercial for uh toys r us the most wonderful time of the year with jeffrey and to me that was just my child i remember that commercial and it fills my heart with warmth mm-hmm. i will tell you a movie though that i think of for christmas and i think i'm the only maybe not the only person but every time ever like every christmas i think about this movie and that is invasion usa i was gonna bring that up i was i was actually surprised that wasn't your choice today and i'm surprised more people don't bring that up when people bring up die Hard. <laughs> it is insane because there's the sequence when the terrorists blow up, you know, they basically use a rocket launcher and like this, the whole scene as a kid, it's like, there's like, it's like, you know, Christmas Eve night or whatever. And, you know, people are stringing Christmas lights and it's very Christmassy and they're all happy families in the suburbs. And all of a sudden these fucking uh, terrorists show up and literally rocket launch all these homes and kill people in their homes. And to me, that was the most, dis- I was so disturbed by that as a kid because the Christmas time you think is everything is happy and you're safe with your family and you don't expect to be, you know, uh, blown up in your home. So uh, that's why I will always think, and that's why, I mean, I wanted those people to, I've never at that point, they, I wanted those people to die probably more than any film villain, just because of, how uh you know how uh, uh you know not sacrilegious but it was just so traumatizing as a kid that uh you would anyways but it's and, uh and, it, and, it stayed with me forever and little known fact santa claus himself only grew his beard after seeing how good it looked on chuck norris that's right exactly <laughs> <laughs> So Invasion USA is not your pick. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, say our picks up front rather than do one and then the other. Um, although sure. I don't, although I don't think that this will be a combined conversation on the two of them, and I'll leave it up to you as to which one you want to talk about first. Uh, but my pick is uh, Christmas Evil from 1980, uh, aka Better Watch Out. And uh, your pick is go ahead is Emmett Otter's Drug Man Christmas, which at 54 minutes, is it a movie? I mean, it was a HBO presentation. Yeah, Yeah. so, but to me, uh, I yeah, I went with Emmett Otter's. Weirdly, because I think naturally, I would have probably gone with a Christmas horror film just because uh, that's in my wheelhouse and just because there's so many of them and Mm -hmm. some good, some not so great. And But I went with the movie that is closest to my heart for Christmas movies, uh, which was a movie that for a long time, nobody gave a fuck about. I think now, in fact, there is talks um, that uh, they are going to make remake it, do a uh, remake with, um, oh God, I'm blanking his name, Brent, uh, one of the guys from Fight of the Concords, the guy that's not Jermaine. Um, and, you know, normally, like I like him uh, and- Brent you know, McKenzie, isn't it? McKenzie, thank you, yeah. yeah. So uh, I don't know about all of that, but uh, anyways, M&I was close to my heart for a multitude of reasons, which I'll get into. So. Like I said, I, I half expected you to say Invasion USA, but then when you texted Emmett Otter, I was like, of course, of course, <laughs> yeah. James is picking Emmett Otter. And, and we've, I think at least once we've watched this together. Oh, um, I'm sure. It is such a, a, a perfect Christmas feeling yes. to watch them. I mean, that's, that's, it's got elements of the O. Henry Christmas story and That's right. uh, just any, it's actually directed by Jim Henson, um, which just makes it magical in my book. As I've said so many times, uh, I consider Jim Henson to actually be, I, I used to say equal inspiration to me as Stanley Kubrick, but I actually put Jim Henson above Kubrick now in terms of 
kind of how I operate, how I work and uh, how I write. Uh, I think Jim Henson, I'm not saying was the better filmmaker. I'm saying uh, inspired me more I, in, in terms of. I totally have zero problem with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, Jim Henson, you know, um, I think one of the actual little geniuses of uh, 20th century America, um, you know, the things that he created stand the, will always stand the test of time. And uh, there's actually a really great documentary. Um, I'm blanking on the name of it. I just watched it yesterday or the day before, but uh, about the history of Sesame Street mm-hmm. and how it, and it's a really great documentary. Um, Was it that street gang one? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I want. I want to see that. I actually, <laughs> I pitched my Burt Reynolds script, uh, my Burt Reynolds inspired script, to the company that um, produced that, and so oh, wow. that's, that's how that got on my radar. And I've been dying to see it. It's really good. It's really well done. Really well done. Um, you know, it's 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 even like I said, it's bigger than even Jim Henson. Just about children's, you know. There's a lot that goes into it, like socioeconomic things about the even the origins and but brilliant documentary. But yeah, I mean, Henson, Henson was somebody I was, you know, when you're a kid, especially in the 80s, you don't, we're not as savvy today. We don't have the internet. So like as a kid, maybe I didn't know um, the names of every director or the, the people that made all the films I liked. I didn't know John McTiernan's name. Like, I, you know, I would recognize it or whatever, but um yeah, I was but a Jim older H- when I realized, oh my God, the guy that did Die Hard did Predator. Predator, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I knew who Jim Henson was, and you know, yes. and this movie uh, really was formative, and it was a movie that you know my mom loved too, and you know that's another reason why I think it's helped with me over the years. But uh, we chose, we couldn't have chosen two more <laughs> different <laughs> films. Well, they have weird about. connections. They they actually do, and, and we'll, I think. By default, we've chosen Emmett Otter as the first film, but uh, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll mention, uh, and it's the more wholesome one anyway. So, yeah. you know, if the kiddies are listening, which uh, first off, maybe shame on you, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> if the kiddies are listening, this will be the uh, more family friendly segment of the show. Uh, but there is a, a Sesame Street connection in in my pick. Um, but you're absolutely right on Jim Henson. Um, he He really... Pop culture wise, uh, it, to me, it's really like Jim Henson, Walt Disney, and Stan Lee. Um, I, I know that there's other creators involved with those three names, you know? Uh, yeah. And especially in the case of Stan Lee, there's actually some, some contention as yeah. to what he did. Um, and, and as far as Walt Disney is concerned, there's some contention as to what yeah. he did. And, and uh, I would like to remind everybody that uh, Walt Disney loved to work out of the public domain. He was not making stories that he created, uh, but he was giving them a life that they never had before. Uh, and uh, Stan Lee and uh, Dick Coe and various other great names that I'm sure James knows better than I do uh, were really giving life and creating the Marvel characters. And Jim Henson created a different universe all to his own, along with Frank Oz and, and, uh, Jerry Nelson was actually involved in this one as well. And uh, before we get to the music, because I know that you'll have some things to say about the music in this film. Yes, uh, I will. Which, and I know it's a special, but I'm still going to call it a film because that's what it felt like growing up. This wasn't yeah. like, uh, you know, CBS plays Rudolph every year and whatever. This To was, me, you can buy it on DVD or, or Blu-ray. It's a, it's a movie. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jerry Nelson uh, was the voice of Emmett Otter in this film and he's no longer with us unfortunately but i do want to just kind of give a run through of his rogues gallery of characters for uh the henson company uh speaking of sesame street alone he was count von count harry monster the amazing mumford simon soundman sherlock hemlock and he was the original snuffleupagus and uh, was Robin, Kermit's nephew, who, who yep. I think vocally shares the most with Emmett Otter. Yeah, yes, 100%. And then uh, he went on, uh, speaking of Henson's work with HBO, he was uh, Gobo the Fraggle, and he was uh, Marjorie the Trash Heap on Fraggle Rock. And then on The Muppet Show, he was uh, Sergeant Floyd Pepper of Electric Mayhem. 
uh, Camilla the chicken, who was uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, Gonzo's girl. Yeah. Uh, and then a couple of names that that I didn't even know. Like I knew the characters, but I didn't know their names. Uh, Lou Zealand was the guy with the boomerang fish. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Crazy Harry was the pyro. And I okay. think I had known Crazy Harry at one point, but uh, and he was the original Statler of Statler and Waldorf, although he only did it for one season because he was overwhelmed with the other characters he was doing. Uh, but I, I wanted to make special mention of him because Jerry Nelson is obviously literally a voice of our childhood that I, yes, you know, of all the names we've mentioned so far on the show, Jerry Nelson is easily the one that slips through the cracks and, and people generally don't know and, and what oh yeah well i mean yeah because henson and oz are always like the ones everybody talks about um but it's funny because robin i loved robin was such a gentle character and such a sweet character uh and had great I, charisma with john denver that's right <laughs> but <laughs> so i always loved uh and he to me he was the perfect voice for emma and otter um yeah let i mean so you mentioned um, Gift of the Magi, so it has that same sort. The plot of this little special is obviously based off of that or has a lot of inspiration. But it, it's it's basically the message is, you know, when you love somebody, what you want to do for them. Um, you know, it's little puppet. First off, it's the goddamn cutest thing. If you've never seen it, which breaks my heart if you haven't, but... It's the cutest goddamn thing I've ever seen. The it little really puppets. Uh, first off, I love otters. Like, just even without this movie, I loved otters. But it makes it even more so. Half my social media is just people, uh, with cats and otter accounts. But they're, the puppets are so damn cute. And, you know, it takes place in this little river town. And they're all little cute little animals. Um, and so it's basically about uh, Emmett and his mom are basically poor uh emmett is like uh you know he's sort of a he fixes things around town an odd jobs guy i'm just blanking yeah. on the term he's a, a jack of all trades of sorts exactly he does the odd jobs around town and then his mother um you know his, his father who was a snake oil salesman uh died like you know <laughs> he died and so they're struggling to get by she washes clothes um so uh but they sing they're, they're a musical family they sing you know I guess at this point I will mention two geniuses. The, the the two geniuses that I think really honestly understood each other, a partnership that nobody ever really talks about, which was Jim Henson and Paul Williams, the great Paul Williams, uh, the man who wrote Rainy Days and Mondays and um, uh, old fashioned love song, like just one of my, you know, a bunch, wrote millions of songs, including the Rainbow Connection, worked with Henson in the Muppet film. <laughs> Just, you know, a, a gifted, you know, um, songwriter. I love him to get death. Uh, also did all the music and one of the actors in Fam of the Paradise, the Brian De Palma horror comedy musical that is also super dear to my heart. But this is just, it's so sweet. And it's, the music is, there's a lot of like Roots Americana like influence and, um, you know, uh, the music just is such a beautiful quality. It's its own thing, but you can see where all the inspiration comes from. But, um, you know, the, the very basic premise is that there's a talent competition and Emmett starts a jug band with his friends. And he, if he wins, he's going to um, uh, buy his mother. Oh, God. Uh, he has piano. to. Put, yes, exactly. But he's got to put a hole in her wash tub so that he can make a stand up bass. And if she wins, she's going to buy him a guitar. Yeah, a it, it was a guitar they saw in the window at the store. That's right. Exactly. Um, Before the but, ruffians in town came into the store. Exactly. Which there's a really place. great uh, uh, outtakes from that scene. Um, Are there really? Yeah, there's a really cute little video. Uh, it's on one of the, the, the Blu-ray or DVD releases, but you can just find it on YouTube. It's a really cute. Uh, there's a sequence when like they... The Riverbottom Nightmare Band, one of the greatest things of in any Jim Henson creation ever. This was sort of like loud glam rock, like Slade sort of uh, rock band with a uh, just. Anyways, I won't go too far into that. But anyways, it, they show didn't up. The, didn't the snake play sitar or something? It yes, pretty, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, 
the little weasel plays the bass. He's all funky on the bass. And then, anyways, it's one of the greatest movies ever. But anyways, I'm not even go through the whole thing because it's just watch. It's a beautiful Christmas story about a mother and a son trying to buy each other presents, and it's got a really you know. There's a lot of like, there's so much heart in the movie. It's it's you know there's a lot of sadness in it. It's like it's not it's not the cheery upbeat movie. Jim Henson movie that I think a lot of people just assume it's just going to be like, it's not the Muppet movies or it's not, there's a lot of like melancholy and sadness and, and, and beauty yeah. and funny and stuff, but it's got a really beautiful ending and a really beautiful message. But um, I just love it. I love it so much. And I think uh, a combination of adorable animal puppets, beautiful music, a beautiful message, and then just the overall magic of Henson and everything that he did and the, the beautiful sets. That's the one thing I just I watch the movie and I literally just marvel at all of these sets that they built for these uh, puppets and it just it fills my heart with joy. Um, but also a little like I said, it makes your heart a little sad because it's you know these these poor struggling little poor animals. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it's be- it's beautiful and brilliant and I think it's I to this day I still think the message of it is the most perfect of any christmas movie i've ever seen it, to me it's got the most perfectly and again it is based off of that you know the gift of the magi and stuff but it, it does it and it's this completely different kind of way so anyways it's that's my that was why it was an easy choice for me yeah it, it was a really good choice on your end uh made me rethink uh the whole approach to everything here and, and i i did rewatch it uh we've been babysitting a uh four-year-old during uh the days during christmas break uh for a friend of ours and so i put it on for him a couple days ago after you had mentioned it because i hadn't seen it frankly in in probably at least 10 years oh wow Uh, yeah it it had been a little while because i've been watching the other movie that we're going to discuss but (laughs) and and (laughs) several others uh but yeah it just had been a while since i'd seen it i i am a muppet aficionado as i'd said but emma daughter as much as i stand by it and love everything about it and think it's one of the greatest things that jim henson ever produced for whatever reason i i I usually reach for you know the muppet movie or or muppets take manhattan or something along those lines Um, i don't think i've i don't think i have gone a single holiday season without watching it i mean ever literally since i i had it on a vhs as a kid then i bought that first you know dvd release i mean i i literally watch it every year it's one of the I will watch that before I watch, you know, like Elf or, you know, um, you know, uh, maybe maybe not before I would watch Christmas Vacation. But, you know, <laughs> they're both classics to me, but, you know, not, you know, anyways, yeah. uh, but but yeah, your choice is a very interesting choice, I will say. Um, well, before we get on to that one, though, there were a couple of things I wanted to point out, uh, you know, because sure. I'm the fun fat guy. Um, sure. <laughs> uh i did want to point out that this was uh the amanada jug band uh was a proof of concept of sorts for henson to produce to convince investors that he could make the muppet movie so no emma daughter potentially no muppet movie i had no i never heard that this is according to paul williams he said that he was approached by henson to write music for this and was told directly, I want to make a Muppet movie, and I don't think that they're going to believe me that these characters can exist outside of a theater, which is where the Muppet show took place. Yeah, that's right. uh, like, I have to create a real-world environment where we... And, and it is, if you uh, think about it, it's the first time you see Kermit riding a bike. Um, that's right. And these, these Muppets are rowing boats, and they live in their own world, whereas the Muppet show, like I said, took place in a theater, and it seemed... It, we, we had, you know puppets go in a theater so you know that that all kind of lined up and sesame street was its own beast you know but he had to prove that he could take these kinds of characters into a a more real world setting and he has them driving you know the gang drives around in what can only be described accurately as a jalopy and jalopy And so I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I I did not know that about it until a couple of days ago, but uh, rewatching it, I could totally see it. I could see how he was just aiming for the rafters to show people that he could he could formulate this into a motion picture. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then uh, 
the other bit that I found out about it, which kind of actually made me a little misty eyed. Um, and I didn't know this. I knew that uh, being green had been sung, but uh, the song from Emmett Otter, When the River Meets the Sea, was sung at Jim Henson's funeral. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Which is incredibly powerful. It's a powerful song on its own. Yes, absolutely. Wow. That actually literally just hearing that kind of made me a little emotional, honestly. like Right? Yeah. <laughs> I can totally see it, though. Yeah. So I wonder yeah. who sung it or if they just played it for the actual cast recording. I have no idea. I, I would love to find out because there's, there is footage that exists of Big Bird singing Being Green at Jim Henson's memorial uh, being played by Carol Spiney. Uh, in fact, That's I think so I wild. saw that footage in the uh, documentary I Am Big Bird. Isn't that what it was called? Yeah. yeah. That, that was a really good documentary, by the way. And, uh, Even know. the Elmo one. I hated Elmo. Like I always... I hated that character, but that's a brilliant documentary too. It's very eye-opening. Um, didn't know anything about that. The you know the uh, puppeteer slash actor who essentially even created him. So yeah, but yeah, the the Carol Spinney documentary is fantastic. I mean, it's you can't go wrong. There's just so much heart and emotion and history and to, like. Anyways, but yeah, um, I didn't know that though. That's I might have to try to see if there's any kind of footage for that because uh, that's amazing. Yeah, I'll look it up and uh, if. Uh, add it to our YouTube or something if if I can find it, and I'll, I'll add in the uh, being green if that's available too, because they're really sure. just powerful moments for not just an incredible artist, but an incredible person who yeah. not only was taken from us so early, but taken so suddenly. Like that was just it was the the same week Sammy Davis Jr. passed away, and he was only in his sixties. But to to me, being you know ten at the time or eleven, uh, it was like well yeah sammy davis jr is an old man <laughs> and, <laughs> uh jim henson was probably only a few years behind him but that was nobody saw it coming it was just oh my god this, this uh, there's a um rip from our world there's a there was a book i don't know how long ago but it it, it it was a you know more than a decade ago but time life released like the 100 greatest photos in the history of time magazine and if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in the top 10 was a picture of um, Henson. Like he's in the, he's, I think they were like, he was literally closing, he was moving from that office, but um, uh, he's sitting in his window, in the, this big window overlooking New York, and he's just literally holding a Kermit puppet. And he's really just looking at it. But it was considered, it's like one of the 100 greatest photos in Time Magazine history. But I love that photo, so I'd never seen it before. But I remember I made a copy of that photo just so I could have a copy of that photo. I loved it so much. There was just something in the, his expression, and anyways. But yeah, it was. This is turning into. <laughs> this is turning into some weird uh, uh, tribute to Henson, which I mean, which I have no problem with, but uh, it's no. not the point of today's episode. But no, we'll we'll do a Henson episode or or something. We have to, yeah, at some point because there's just so much out there. Absolutely. So I, I guess we can go ahead and do a full attitude switch here. <laughs> exactly. My pick could not be any more different. I did not show this to the four-year-old that we've been babysitting, um, but it is a movie that I watch every year. My tradition is to watch it while I'm wrapping presents. Um, I wrap presents late at night because I don't want anybody to see what I'm wrapping. And so it is a perfect time to put on 1980s Christmas Evil. Uh, AKA better watch out, which is such a better title, but yeah. But I mean, Christmas evil has the play on the, you know, you know, Eve and Eve. I mean, sure. Sure. But is uh, it even, well, let's get in. We'll, we'll get into it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, for those that are not familiar with it, uh, it was directed by uh, dire written and directed by Lewis Jackson, uh, who is kind of a, a drive-in sort of director at the time. Uh, he he do, has not done anything that I don't, I, I can't even mention anything that I know that he's done. Uh, I know he's done a few things, but nothing that I've seen. I don't know how, Lightning just, he caught it in a bottle for this movie. Uh, and apparently it, it came to him sometime in the 70s. It took him 10 years to get this financed. Uh, he was stoned and he, people say that he had a vision of Santa Claus holding a butcher knife 
And a lot of people are like, oh, come on, you don't hallucinate on marijuana. And I'm like, no, I, re- I legitimately think he just had the vision in his head. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. As a person who has come up with some really great creative ideas on marijuana, I don't see imagining Santa Claus with a butcher knife as being so out of line. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> or so literal, like he's, yeah. Yeah, he, he didn't think Santa Claus was coming after him exactly. with a butcher knife. He just had the vision in his head and said, there's something there. Uh, and this was before there had even been a single Christmas horror movie in the early yeah. 70s. Uh, the the subgenre created itself really with this movie, but took off a couple years later with some others. Um, but it, it, he himself, uh, Lewis Jackson, has said his movie represents in a way the closing out of 60s and 70s type filmmaking and movies like Silent Night, Deadly Night, the things that came later that really stirred up the, the controversy. Most of those were just slasher ripoffs, right. which was very 80s. Um, and so he, he, he likes to differentiate himself from those, uh, not by saying, hey, look at me, I'm the first, uh, even though he is, uh, but by saying, I, I approached this from a completely different standpoint. He didn't make it to make money. He made it because he wanted to do this art film and he wanted to do a character study. And so, you know, like, like the movies that I just mentioned, the Silent Night, Deadly Night, and a couple of the other ones, those are straight up slasher movies. Those are, you know, looking for the hot teenagers, uh, Santa Claus is a killer, wahaha. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of them are better than others, but none of them, in my opinion, are really truly great. Um, as far as the Silent Night, Deadly Nights, or, you know, the... The Silent Night, Deadly Night franchise is very weird because they go into some weird ass places, you know, um, really weird places. Um, <laughs> like some of the later films in the series, um, you know, uh, this is not going to turn into a Silent Night Deadly. I actually used to think there's a lot of imagination and weird imagination in some of the films, even three which everybody hates um i think is really interesting because that's it's just the one so... with the exposed brain right on brain bill yeah bill mosley yeah. that's right he has an, like a glass jar dome yeah exactly yeah um, i i give them bonus points for creative weirdness but the movies that that movie in particular is just so boring to me it's boring it's very drags and it's very slow i think there's a lot of cool imagery but yeah it's definitely it's definitely not for everybody um where the fourth one is just fucking weird and even more weird um and half of the second one is a flashback to the first one that's right exactly exactly 100 yeah so uh and the first one's not great but it has i mean again the hit the (laughs) they really try to hammer over the you over the head with like why this kid is getting now psychotic because he just goes through the weirdest trauma in his life he just all these weird random traumatic experiences but to to stay on point with <coughs> excuse me with um uh christmas evil aka better watch out yeah it, it's 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 i don't consider it a horror movie i it is closer to something like you know um taxi dr- i mean i was just about to say taxi driver he- yeah Jackson says Frankenstein. I say Taxi Driver. Yeah, I would see more of Taxi Driver. It's a guy who's like losing. He's an idealist. Not that Travis Bickle's an idealist, but he has his point of view. But this is a guy who. Well, first off, let's talk about. We have to talk about this first and foremost. The origin story. <laughs> a very weird <laughs> oh, origin story. Wait, I just have to kind of course correct for a second uh just popped into my head black christmas definitely beats this in terms was of chronology first. and that is a slasher but, it, movie, but there but was no the, it, there was no slasher movie at the time like it yeah black christmas really created the slasher movement and this is separate from that yeah and it also wasn't a killer santa claus so no like, it was not it was a, yeah. it was a slasher movie that took place on christmas during and, christmas exactly yeah. so but um but yeah let's Dan, why don't you explain <laughs> the uh circumstances to uh i don't know if it's a trauma are they saying that was trauma is that why he's 
Well, it fucked them up. That's for yeah. sure. Uh, <coughs> he okay. The, the the lead actor in this, and he's in virtually every scene. And uh, I I actually think he's one hundred percent brilliant. I think it's one of my favorite performances I've ever seen in any kind of a thriller or horror film. Uh, Brandon Maggart, yeah, uh, who nowadays seems to be best known as Fiona Apple's father, if he's known at all. Yeah, uh, although true. he has won several like Cable Ace awards for his Showtime show Brothers, and he's done others. Oh, and this is the connection. He was in the first season of Sesame Street. Oh, was he? He was. He was in the first season of Sesame Street, uh, which was before our time. Sesame Street started about 10 years before I was born, so I did not grow up with Brandon Maggard on Sesame Street. I was already into the bald Gordon and uh exactly second <laughs> Gordon yeah uh but I was there for Mr. Hooper you know th- there's a whole chronology of Sesame Street that he was right. he was one of the first ones there so this guy's definitely uh someone that that knows Henson that's such a weird coincidence though that's such a weird isn't that strange uh but in within the story of Christmas Evil uh we start as so many of these Christmas horror movies do with a uh, flashback sort of prologue. I think we're in the forties on this one and uh, two brothers and their mother are slowly quietly creeping down the stairs so that they can get a glimpse of Santa Claus and Santa Claus comes down the chimney. And, you know, of course we know this is their father uh, in a costume and it's a really creepy looking costume. And might I add, there's something really disturbing they leave out, you know, the milk and the cookies for him. And they also, for some reason, leave a wash station out for him. There's like soap and water and he uses that. And then he eats the, the milk and cookies, but he eats them through this obscenely long mustache. And it, it makes me want to gag every time I see it. And it was kind <laughs> I of, know exactly what you- <laughs> It's kind of how I first realized this movie was going to be something special to me because who would think to have it? It's still, at this point anyways, played up to be a sweet scene but it's so unnerving to see him eating and especially drinking milk through this now like gross soggy mustache that at this point you can almost figure probably has last year's milk and cookies still in it. Exactly. Ugh. Uh, but you know, uh, it's cute. And the kids love it. And uh, the kids go upstairs to sleep and they are arguing about whether that was really Santa and, uh the one little boy who becomes our lead character goes downstairs and he sees mommy kissing santa claus and he kind of sees santa claus kissing mommy down there and another really kind of uneasy scene because this movie never gets like slasher movie sexual this this isn't a movie where we're supposed to be titillated or like i don't there's one scene later in the movie where there's kind of a bush shot but it it stands out and seems out of place because it's not in any of the rest of the movie uh it's it's weird (laughs) but uh yeah for whatever reason like the kid sees santa claus down on his knees in front of his mother by the tree and mother is laughing and and he's completely traumatized by this and my first impression of this and i think most people's first impression of this is that he thinks Santa Claus is a creep. Um, But that doesn't make sense to the rest of the story for him to go on to be obsessed with Santa Claus as this major point of um, of his life's inspiration as a a figure of purity and innocence and what's good with the world. I don't see how that comes from him viewing the mommy kissing Santa Claus moment. And I realized later on, um, probably by the second or third time, he realizes that's his father, but that his father and his mother are unclean and that they deceived him. And this made him angry. And now he spent the rest of his life, we cut to him older, his name's Harry. We cut to him older and he's in Santa Claus pajamas and has one of the best sort of uh, weird quirky morning routines i've seen since peewee's big adventure where he's just like doing calisthenics in this christmas in his santa claus outfit and put shaving cream on his face uh, and, and kind of gives himself a giggle because it looks like he's santa claus 
you start to realize that I think he believes Santa Claus is really there, but Santa Claus has deserted us or we're all just too bad for Santa Claus to show up anymore because the way he talks about the world and of course he works in a toy factory and the way he talks about the crappy toys that his toy factory is putting out. I think he's just upset at the world that we don't live up to Santa Claus's standards. And so he sees himself as Santa's little helper. Yep. And he's, it's made him a peeping Tom, this whole experience, very much a voyeur. And he's been keeping a list, two big books in his room of the good children and the bad children and exactly what their uh, bona fides are. You know, like he has a list under uh, like this one kid who has one of the greatest names in a movie ever. I don't know why I like it so much, but it's this one kid named Moss Garcia, M-O-S-S, who really bothers Harry because he reads Penthouse magazine. The the kid does. And, you know, it's just kind of, he's got this whole list of uh, bad personal hygiene and, you know, <laughs> teases his brother or something like that. It's really ridiculous stuff. And it's really genuinely creepy. It's getting under your skin, watching him be such a voyeur. I, I really don't know that I'm doing this any justice in describing it, it's really all in the performance brandon maggart playing this character where he's doing these really bad things but you never for one thing you never get the feeling that there's a pedophilia angle to it no he's watching children to watch their behavior not to get off and i think that's another thing that separates him from a lot of the other evil santas that came along is he's never doing this I think because the violence turns him on. I think he's doing this because he wants simply wants to reward the good and punish the bad. 100%. Yeah. He's, he's, he's trying to follow in Santa's footsteps. Yes. And so he's got this list and uh, he, there's a scene that a lot of people don't really know what it's about where he's, he goes to Moss Garcia's house and he's watching him uh, do bad things through the window. And then he hears, uh, he, he, stoops down and he picks up hands full of mud and slathers it on his face and hands and then goes to the side of the house of Moss Garcia's house and puts his handprints and lip prints on the side of the house and it's really really bizarre but apparently it was actually part of German folklore that people would I don't know if it was specifically for Santa probably uh, but people would mark the side of houses for who needed to be punished uh, for the punishers by marking it with mud handprints and mouth prints. Uh, so there actually was a legitimate reason why this ended up in the movie uh, and adds to the theory that he sees himself as Santa Claus's helper rather yeah. than being Santa Claus himself. And at a certain point, of course, he goes fully off the deep end and realizes that he's santa and there's a the scene where he's he's looking in the mirror and he's like gluing the hair onto his face and he starts to laugh and just goes hysterical it's one of my favorite scenes uh it's one of the ones that people talk about the most because the glee and at the same time, the anger and just the, the dementedness, yeah. yeah, the psychosis is really coming out. And what's happening at that point is that this is a man who believes in Santa Claus and just realized that it's him. All this time, he's been waiting for Santa Claus, but oh, wait, I'm the one that has to accept the calling. And he truly becomes an impressive Santa Claus. He, he knits this whole suit with like dark fur around it and, st- and it, it's an incredible santa claus suit and he starts to make his own toys out of cast iron which he will eventually weaponize <laughs> um meanwhile there's a whole side story with him and his brother who's a young version of uh um uh, oh his name is uh jeffrey demun i think uh, who was later on did uh, The Mist and The Walking Dead, was an actor in those. Um, but there, there's problems with his brother who knows that he's cracked. And when he first hears stories about a murderous Santa, he pretty much knows it's his brother. All these little side stories. But 
it all comes down to being a character story about about uh brandon maggart's harry character uh, much like taxi driver is a character study of travis bickle you, you don't have to agree with him but it's nope. fascinating to see not how he ticks but that he ticks to see what he does what what is his habit what are his habits what are his routines um and a lot of people have called this movie boring uh and i think that's largely to do with the fact that the marketing for this including the name christmas evil that was slapped on it against the director's wishes uh has always made this look like a slasher movie and anybody who's expecting a slasher movie is understandably bored by this movie there's not a lot of killing in fact there's no well, like, killing for like three quarters of it. Yeah, exactly. And the killings are weirdly random and um yeah. and they're yeah. intermixed. There's a killing and then there's him doing something nice, and then there's a killing, yeah. and then so it's not just he goes on a murderous rampage. He's the first people he kills are people that come out of a midnight mass and start making fun of him. Uh, yeah. which is first off, the only time religion is ever brought up in the storyline. There that no one even says the name Jesus. It's not attacking the religious elements of this holiday no um but people come out of midnight mass and i think the only message there is that the people coming out of midnight mass should be the ones who are better behaved but are not and they're you know they're teasing him and so he takes the bayonet on his uh, little tin soldier and jams it right into a dude's eye and then he takes out this uh beautiful sort of toy hatchet which apparently is sharpened to yeah. a point and <laughs> I was going to say, it's very weird, yeah. Sinks it into the, the skulls of a couple other people outside of there. And then he's, he flees. He gets out of there before they catch him. And he starts peeping into a party because he hears the music. And from there, he's caught peeping. But instead of being ostracized like he, or made fun of like he was outside of the Midnight Mass, he's invited in like, oh, Santa Claus, you've got to come in. We've got kids. And he does this whole show for these kids and he just makes their Christmas. And this is after he just stuck a fucking toy into somebody's eyeball on the streets of New York City. And it definitely gets a little creepy. And even the adults kind of are like, okay, maybe it's time to get this guy out of here. But ultimately, you can see how this Christmas party was not going to be this kick ass without Harry being there. <laughs> um. So it really does juxtapose between those two things and shows, I, I think the importance of it is to show that he's not in this to do evil. He's in this to do good. And he never actually hurts a kid, even Moss Garcia, the kid that he hates the most. Uh, he doesn't hurt Moss Garcia. One, one scene, he scares the hell out of him. Uh, but in, when it comes to him actually being Santa, he leaves him a huge bag full of dirt with his name on it. So he got punished by getting a rotten gift. Um, but it's the adults that that have allowed their children to become so shitty that actually yeah. this is wrath. People that people that either disrespect the spirit of Christmas or like outright, you know, you know, ruin Christmas for people. Uh, those are the people that he has a problem with. But uh, you know, it's definitely, you know, it's. I think for the longest time, I think you nailed it where it got a reputation for being the slasher or this like very like, you know, bloody, you know, horror movie. And it's, it's, it's not that it's, it's a character study. It's not even about, particularly violent. It's no, it's not. not. There's, there's only like four, I think four people get killed in it, which is, I mean, I, I think know. there's, I think it's five, but is it five? But, but no, you're right. It's four. It's three of them in that midnight mass. So one scene takes down three of them exactly yep. and then the other one is a co-worker who's been giving him shit since the shit. beginning and yeah. even then he kills the co-worker sleeping right next to his wife which is kind of creepy it's really atmospheric um but then as he's fleeing the house he runs into the kids in the house of the person who he just killed and he smiles at them and does the little touch nose thing you know because he's the santa thing, yep. <laughs> and the kids are smiling not knowing that their dad's already murdered in the next room that's right so the atmosphere that's a thing. god that's the thing is exactly is that it's far more disturbing and creepy and atmospheric than most of the films that came later which were just you know gratuitous and violent for with no actual sort of uh spirit behind it or whatever but uh i think i think it's been a victim of 
it again, it's also just weird, and it ha- goes into some weird, weird. I'll let you finish talking about, it, but there's I'm sure one thing we need to discuss. So, all right, cool. Because uh, it weird is the right word. Um, unsettling is another really good yeah. word for it. Harry's house is decorated like a Santa Claus fanatic, you know, um, the way that someone who is stalking another person might keep, you know, cut out photographs of them in their bedroom or whatever. This guy's entire house is that for Santa Claus. And it's actually one of the coolest parts of this. The the set design on this movie actually is pretty incredible um, for its budget. But uh, the director who, like I said, knew for 10 years that he wanted to make this movie and kept on rewriting it and rewriting it to make it less expensive to make until he could finally make it. Um, he collected all this Santa Claus ephemera himself. And so I, I'm guessing he probably still has it somewhere. But this is all like, this might be the biggest Santa Claus collection I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, but it adds so much to the just atmosphere, the, the weirdness of everything. He, he found some really creepy looking old uh, advertisements of Santa Claus where he kind of has the arched eyebrows and looks like he's the punisher of the bad children. <laughs> uh, he, he found some old um, medieval artwork of Santa in judgment of people. Uh, it, it, some of the things he does visually. OK, first off. To be fair, some of the stuff he does visually gets shit on, and it should because it's laughable and it's silly. But it's laughable and silly in the same way that uh, we talked about the Don Dohler films with uh, our guest a couple of months ago, um, Dick Dizel, where they're budgetary constraints. By the end of the movie, they weren't shooting at Christmas time. They needed snow on the ground, so they cut up a bunch of uh, they shredded plastic bags, and it actually makes effective snow falling. But on the ground, they had to use like basically huge chunks of white felt or, you know, tablecloths yeah. and things. And there's a, there's one particular scene towards the end where a character falls down and like the whole <laughs> thing takes, lifts up. Yeah, he takes the whole thing with him sliding down the hill. <laughs> and yeah, laughable. I'm <laughs> totally willing to laugh at that. It is such a dumb thing, but it's also a budgetary constraint. And I'm not going to yeah. call the movie bad for that. Um, yeah, the other thing he has a when there's a murderous santa on the loose of course the police have a lineup of santa clauses at the station so that the witnesses can pick out which santa claus it was and just the image of like five or six santa clauses in a row one of which is approaching seven feet tall i was gonna say dude Devin, <laughs> i was I, this is there one of them is literally seven feet tall by the you know the the height scale that they always have in you know the backgrounds and it's it bothered me that nobody mentioned the seven foot tall santa uh but, but the, yeah it's a great the fact that they got an actual toy factory apparently the producer edward pressman his his family owned a toy factory and they agreed to let them shoot there uh under the condition that they did not use the toys that they actually made there as the toys in the movie uh, which was okay anyways, because uh, part of Harry's point is that they make crappy toys. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that's taking place at a toy factory that's really giving us a glimpse of like blue collar America in the early 80s, which is arguably the last strong era of blue collar America. And they're talking about unions and things like that, that, that don't really exist anymore to, to the same strength anyways that they, that they did at the time. Uh, the the, there's there's these incredible shots of the uh, the Macy's parade, which he's watching on television, and it's supposed to be the televised, quote unquote, televised Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade. Uh, but they couldn't afford to license that, so he went to the Macy's parade in in New York City and filmed it himself. And he actually got a shot, which you will never see on a on television. He got a shot of Santa Claus looking directly at his camera. And it's actually kind of chilling, but it makes you wonder because you would never see a close up of Santa Claus face just looking right at you. Like the best actor in the world can't look at the camera naturally, you know, in the same way that just looking over and seeing somebody with a camera would look. Um, but in a weird way, you can't act looking at a camera without looking like an actor. 
And certainly yeah. if you're Santa Claus, you're looking at a camera and waving and ho, ho, ho. Exactly. He got the Macy's Santa looking at the camera and kind of being like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> and it makes you wonder, is, is this the version of the parade that's in Harry's head? And Santa Claus is looking directly at him. Um, all, he also managed to put together, Jackson put together an amazing soundtrack that could never be put together nowadays on a low budget that has multiple of the Darlene Love, uh, Phil Spector Christmas songs, uh, James Brown Christmas song. Um, there's a disco Christmas song, which if you look at the, at the work party, there's a guy who's disco dancing towards the left side of the camera by himself. And it is one of the most laugh out loud, dumb things I've ever seen in a party scene in a movie. <laughs> but it, it is, all of this is just to say it's, it's shot very capably and it's written very capably. And where it does fall apart, I usually see it in terms of budgetary constraints and not so much talent restraints, but experience restraints, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that this movie deserves another look by everybody uh, who's interested in, in independent films, horror films, thrillers, character studies. Uh, it, it really is worthy of a reexamination. And I've seen or I've listened to other podcasts who have covered this film and almost all of them agree that it has something to it more than other movies. But they ultimately they say it, that it's boring and it's dumb. I am here to say that they are wrong. They watched the movie with the wrong pair of eyes. Uh, this movie's not boring. Watching this guy's descent into madness is captivating to me. Okay. So here's the one thing that I want to ask your opinion on. Okay. Is the, is the ending. I, I was waiting to bring up the ending because I had a feeling that was what you were going to bring up. Just because it... <laughs> I mean, to me, it's metaphor. It, like, I can only, I have to assume it's metaphorical. That you know, do we do we want to see what the ending is? Well, I think we can give a spoiler alert, and if you don't want to know the ending of uh, Christmas Evil, perhaps it's time to uh, shut off and go watch the movie and come back. There we uh, go. Because it it's it is one of those ones where it cannot be discussed without the ending, and the movie is you know over forty years old now, anyways. But exactly. uh, you do not see the movie coming because it's even with its amateurishness and its cheapness, it never breaks the idea that this is supposed to be real or taken seriously. Yeah, it's not fantastical exactly. or supernatural in any way at all. No. It's actually very psychological and somewhat grounded in a bent reality. And Harry lives in a bent reality. But <laughs> I think a lot of the ending, and not just the last 30 seconds, but a lot of the last, say, 10, when 15 like minutes. Brother. Yeah, his brother, when he finally goes to his brother and he has a content, a content what's the word, contemptuous relationship with his brother? contentious relationship with his brother um like i said his brother has already put together the pieces and knows that his that harry is the one that's uh on a murder spree in new york city his brother starts to strangle him and i think you can make the argument that harry dies there um i'd uh, see that's uh, exactly what i one of the interpretations i sort of assumed. there's multiple points where harry could have died um and part of this is due to the fantastical fact that the people in the neighborhood who spot him within 30 seconds have torches and are chasing him through yeah. the snow. Like he's with fucking torches, Frankenstein. Which, yes, which, which uh, Lewis Jackson specifically points out was an inspiration for this film. Although up until the torches, I don't see how this is a Frankenstein movie. Um, so that's where I will separate from Jackson and say, yeah, I think he got that a little off, but the fantastical element of him being chased by people with torches. I mean, it, it shows that, you know, it, there's a villager element to that, which I can see how a village would, would fit into something of a, uh, Christmas story or a Santa Claus story. But, um, that's not even the part that's, that's fucking crazy. Uh, 
what's crazy weird, but it's is, not crazy. Yes. What Harry has done is because every good peeping Tom Boyer who is fascinated with children must by law have a windowless van. Um <laughs> he paints a sleigh on the side of his windowless van. And that's what he carries his toys around when he's he's spreading joy and murder across the city. Um, but then he's he's being chased by the, the torch holders in his van, and he drives off of a bridge, and you would think that he would plummet to the ground and and uh perish. Yeah, suffer but, from a thing called gravity. Yes, but apparently gravity does not apply to Harry anymore because his whole van flies off the bridge and up towards the moon uh, with Harry chuckling and ho-ho-hoing inside and we close on the final uh, the final verse of A Night Before Christmas <laughs> and some people claim that they can hear Harry's van hit the ground right as that scene's happening and I think you can make that argument because there is noise but he's also running off the side of a bridge so it could be yeah the things you know the rest of the debris, debris. That comes with that yeah um but you could very well make the argument that harry has died and in his own head his soul has been set free and he is now santa claus he is the real santa claus yeah and that's i mean obviously you know it's i don't think it's meant to say oh yeah he really was santa claus and now he's flying off with his reindeerless rape van into the moon or whatever but um <laughs> but it's very bizarre i remember seeing it for the first time and you know it's i will say the first time i saw it you know i was very much pulled into it. it's like um uh 42nd street you know that sort of grindhousey vibe of it and it, it played on 42nd street every year for almost a decade i totally hit i totally believe that but mm -hmm. Uh, but even when I got to the ending, I was like, what? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> but I've since watched it, you know, multiple times and I sort of go, okay, it's, it's metaphorical than that, you know, exactly like what you think, like either that he did die when his brother was basically choking him and while his fucking nephews were watching. Um, and that everything after that is, you know, he's, is it either a dream or whatever. Um, or they, that you said the real thing is he drove off the cliff, but we're seeing him set, you know. But either way, it's really, at first I hated the ending because it was just so out of left field. I, I don't then, think there's anybody who enjoys the ending who didn't have to go through a process of coming to terms with it before they admitted they yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, but now it totally works and it's the perfect ending for that movie. But it is, like you said, it's a, it, it's a very fascinating um, character study. And Harry, the, you know, the character is the whole film like you're going with like you're going along with him and his motivations and his frustrations and his psychosis and his obsessions um and he's not even though he he kills three people uh you know in one big murderous fit he's you never think that this guy's evil like you never see it i mean obviously that's an evil act and blah 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 but you sort of see him as, you know, this guy who's been put upon and made fun of and misunderstood. And you can see him evil, maybe not quite as easily as you can see Travis Bickle as evil, because at least Travis Bickle is is killing like a pimp and uh, yeah. But but the the motivation for vengeance and cleansing of the city is essentially the same. But yeah, it's a very fascinating movie. It's not a 80s slasher. It's not even I think some people thought it was played. It's supposed to be played for laughs, but I, it's not. It's not. It's funny, but it's not played. It's got like, funny moments, exactly. Yeah. But it's not. It's not. It's not like satirical in the way I think of some people think of it as. Or there's not like an irony. Oh, this is so bad. It's good element, which we already know how I feel about that concept. To begin with, I but. think a lot of people think it is because of like the the cheap special effects and the you know, the, the, yeah, the, the things that we yes, discussed absolutely. before, but, and they and then they tend to think I I think. That the things that are genuinely hysterical and intentionally hysterical are, 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 are only by mis they're incidentally hysterical because the movie's so bad. And I don't, I, I agree don't with that one thousand percent exactly. I think you nailed it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely you know, um, I bought the uh, vinegar syndrome 
uh, Blu-ray that came out, I think last year, was it last year or the year before? But I think it was the year um, before, but yeah, that's what it, it's, it's a must have. Yeah. You got to grab it. It's a gr great release. Um, definitely. You know, uh, if you like some of the sleazier end of uh, all day movies, it uh, is sleazy. I will give you, it is extremely yeah, absolutely. Sleazy. Um, but, but yeah, in that way that, you know, uh, is, it, you know, is, in, is entertainment, but very interesting dynamic of films that uh, we both chose. <laughs> I think you, oh. you, cho you choosing Christmas evil made me go, okay, let me go a little bit the other way. Cause <laughs> Um, and I will say, because you mentioned that Vinegar Syndrome disc, uh, the Vinegar Syndrome disc has like three different commentaries from, from held over from different releases. Trauma had this for a little while. They didn't do anything to clean it up. They did do some cool special features where they, did, they interviewed people. But because it's Trauma, it's like, like they actually got an interview with Brandon Maggart and who, who um, has gone on to become like an author and still does stage and stuff but he's being co-interviewed with sergeant kabuki man and yeah. you know one of the questions is what do you think of paul thomas anderson who happened to be married to his daughter who i believe is probably estranged from him so it's actually a very inappropriate question to ask him and he doesn't really answer it um so it's a bad interview but it's cool to see that he's still at that time was still around and and you know willing to be interviewed on this because sometimes these uh, people don't want to be interviewed about some of their more sleazy work especially if you have a pedigree like sesame street and showtime's brothers behind you but uh one of the great features on this disc is a audio commentary with the director um and john waters who claims this is his favorite christmas movie of all time yeah and it is say. it is such a john waters movie uh, but John Waters was bringing up a lot of, he was saying that there's a, an underlying trans message in this, where this is a person who's uncomfortable in his body and does not know his true identity. And the fetishizing of the outfit, the way he lovingly makes the outfit himself. And when he's cutting the fur, it's like he's cutting it from his mom's old furs and he like strokes his face with it before he cuts into it. And and like once he finally puts on the Santa outfit and glues the thing onto his face, he has come out. He's come out of the Santa closet, as John Waters is putting it. And, uh, you know, of course, the, the director is sitting right next to him at that point in time and, and saying, you know, it wasn't written that way, but I can completely see it. Um, and said, so like, yeah, I wish that I had, you know, I don't think it's a trans message was kind of what the director was saying, which wasn't it wasn't an anti-trans statement to say it. It no, just was just saying. Attention. Uh, but he says, like, I wish that I had known this at the time because I think I could have played up the fetishizing of the of the other stuff even more. And uh, it, really, I mean, this guy does have a Santa Claus fetish. That part's undeniable. And he's oh, not yeah. getting off on it. It's just that it's part of his personality um, yeah. and his identity. There is a little bit of kink shaming and the idea that uh, he gets completely screwed up by finding out that his parents have an interesting love life. Yeah. But, uh, but ultimately, yeah, this was a really fun movie to watch with John Waters, and I highly recommend that commentary if you haven't heard it. Yeah, anything with John Waters is highly recommended. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but... Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, I, I could go on about this movie for far too long, so I should probably cut myself off before I talk too much about it. Um, and I think you were winding us up anyways, because we're, we're already past our point for making this a short episode. <laughs> exactly. Um, but no, this was a great, I mean, we, this was sort of a spur of the moment decision for this episode specifically. But uh, to me, it is, this episode perfectly encapsulates what I think this, our, this podcast is about. Yes. You know, we're not just, we don't pigeon our whole, hold ourselves in the one corner. We, you know, we have lots of inspirations, lots of loves, and we can enjoy the grind house and the sleaze as long, as well as the Jim Henson and the Muppets and the heart and, you know, the, uh, the Paul Williams song. So anyways, Devin, this was a uh, fun as always. I really enjoy these. I'm glad we got one more in for 2021. Me too. Hopefully 2020. Me too. Um, so hopefully though, 2022, uh, we can start recording these with more regularity. 
we can get, you know, um, get these out quicker. Um, but hopefully if you are listening to this and you enjoy it, please, uh, like, and subscribe, uh, wherever your podcasts are available. Uh, we are on YouTube. Um, you, you can also now rate us on Spotify, apparently. But please do that if, if you are so inclined. Yeah. Uh, I will not beg, but if you are so inclined. I'll beg. But yeah, Devin. Tell everybody I, we're great. That's right, exactly. <laughs> please. Uh, um, but Devin, I just want to say happy holidays, Merry Christmas to you and yours, and a happy new year. And I look forward to uh, continuing this podcast into the upcoming new year. Same here, back at you. Merry Christmas and uh, happy new year to you guys. I am so glad that it seems as if the worst of it is over and that you and your son are on the mend. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm an optimistic person generally, and I knew you were going to come through the other side, but I just felt so bad for how miserable I knew you were. Uh, so, well, like I said, I got an early Christmas present because before the full two weeks were up, I started feeling better. So I'll take that. That's uh, that made my Christmas uh, uh, and my holidays good right there i'm not in bed i can breathe uh and my son is doing well so but i appreciate that devin thank you so much and uh one more just uh as non-political as i can get it make sure everybody out there is getting vaccinated get boosted i i have my booster now uh i am a regular smoker so this thing terrifies me uh so get get it for you and get it for everybody around you yeah Um, and i mean really I can tell you, uh, if, uh, if, if I wasn't fully vaccinated, I don't know. I literally don't know if I would be here because I got hit really hard, but thankfully never got it, you know, as, as, as heavy as it's hit some people. So be safe out there, take care of yourselves, take care of your loved ones. Uh, and I hope everybody out there has a wonderful rest of their holiday season. Yep. Merry Christmas, everybody. And if Moss Garcia is out there, you better watch out. <laughs>